Hi friends. Today we are going to read a story about Susan B. Anthony. If you don't know who Susan B. Anthony is, here is a picture of her. So you can see Susan B. Anthony um, right here. She is famous for being part of the women's suffrage movement. Women's suffrage meaning um, the right to vote for women. Though she never had the right to vote, she is one of the women and people, uh, men helped too. Um, she's one of the people responsible for giving women that right to vote, even though she never had it herself. So the book we're going to look at today is Susan B. Anthony. You can see the cover here. And it was uh, written by Alexandra Walner. Again, um, here's a closer, a close up shot of the book. Um, and here is a note from the author to the many wonderful women I have known who have brought about change, both great and small. I dedicate this book, Alexandra Walner and uh, a quote from Susan B. Anthony, cautious, careful people never can bring about a reform. Um, that's a pretty cool quote you should consider. Susan Brunel Anthony was born on February 15th, 1820 in Adams, Massachusetts. That was a long time ago. If you look here, um, it's kind of a snowy outside. Um, she was born in February, which is cold because February is uh, during winter time. She was raised with six sisters and brothers by loving but strict parents who did not want their children to play with toys and games, sing songs or paint pictures. For fun, Susan would watch a colony of ants play in fields of wildflowers, catch snowflakes or watch sunsets from the mountain behind her family's house. So there's that close up picture. You can see Susan playing in the snow. So like most girls at the time, Susan and her sisters cooked, sewed, quilted, cleaned, and did other household chores. But the girls of Susan's family were luckier than most. Unlike many parents, Susan's wanted their granddaughters as well as their sons to have an education. By the time she was four, Susan had already learned to read from her grandfather. So you can see her grandfather there teaching her how to read. When she was older, Susan was sent to a district school. One day she came home upset because her male instructor wouldn't teach her math. Many people believe that certain school subjects were too hard for a girl's brain. So her father who owned a mill started his own school for workers children where both the boys and the girls would learn the same subjects as it should be. Susan's father hired a young teacher named Mary Perkins who had graduated from a good girls school a good girls' school. Soon admired Mary because she was, Susan admired Mary because she was educated and earning her own living. So back in the time, um, you know, it was kind of relatively unknown for a woman to be making her own living. So Susan admired that. But um, Susan's father was fair, but Susan found that even he was not fair all the time. At her father's mill, Susan took over the job of a girl worker who was sick for two weeks. She earned $3, although the men were getting more money for doing the same job. 
She suggested to her father that he promote a girl who worked with her because she knew more about the job than her male boss. But her father said that it would never do to have a woman oversee the mill. You can see Susan talking to her dad. So her dad was a fair man uh, for that time period. Um, you know, he hired women and had a school for girls, but even he didn't understand why a woman should have such a promotion. After Susan learned all she could at the factory school, she asked her father to send her to a girls' school, which he did. Now she was getting a better education, but sadly she had to leave school after just a year because of a family money problem. So again, when her, when she asked, her dad did send her to the school as long as he could. When she was 18, you can see her there. She's starting to grow up. I'm gonna show you guys this picture and then I'm gonna zoom out so I can read and then I'll get the pictures back up. So when she was 18, Susan had to decide what to do next. At the time, there were only two days for a young woman or two ways for a young woman to live. Either she got married or she got a job teaching. Susan chose to be independent and rely on herself. She got a job at a school for girls. She was worried, though, that she didn't know enough about different subjects to be a good teacher. But she soon discovered that she was still ahead of her students. Like most girls' educations, her students' had been very poor. After a few years, even though her students liked her, she got tired of teaching because it was not a challenge anymore. But what other work could she do? So again, you can see her teaching her students there. Um, a job that a lot of women did back in the day. And I'm gonna show you this picture of her writing and watch this picture and think in your mind what might be happening here as I read the next page. So, she believed that there were many things wrong with laws at the time. Women were not treated as the equals of men. They could not get a good education, own property, get equal pay or vote, which is called women's suffrage. There was slavery and lack of education for African Americans. She thought drinking a lot of alcohol was wrong, which is called temperance. Susan decided to become a voice for change. These issues would be her new challenges. Instead of teaching just a few, she would speak to many. Maybe the people who listened to her would urge lawmakers to change unfair laws. When Susan was 28, she left her safe teaching job to start an uncertain career battling for reform. It would make her unpopular because people were not used to women speaking in public. So you can see her there contemplating what she was going to do next. She used money she had saved from teaching to travel to many towns. I'm gonna lift this picture up here. You can see her speaking as I read the next page. Um, Often in winter, when people were so bored, they would come to any meeting and even pay money just for something to do. She did all the work herself, finding her own hotel and lecture hall and arriving early to light the room. Sometimes people came to her speeches and made fun of her. They shouted while she was talking through, rotten eggs at her even threatened her with knives and pistols. In spite of these hardships, and although she was alone, she continued working for her causes. Uh, girls and boys, aren't we lucky that someone like Susan B. Anthony came before us to basically win these battles for us? There, you see her with a friend. Then Susan met Elizabeth Stanton. 
who had organized the first convention to champion women's rights. They soon became good friends. Now Susan was someone who shared her ideas. They helped each other organize meetings and write about women's voting rights. Although Susan traveled and Mrs. Stanton usually stayed home to raise her family, Susan said, we did better work together than either could alone. Um, we like to say stronger together, uh, better together. So here's the next picture that you guys can look at. There you see, and think what's gonna happen next based off that picture. So once Susan went to a teacher's convention in New York, most of the 500 teachers present were women who got less pay than men for the same jobs. She listened for some praise for the women teachers from the men, but there was none. Even sadder, she discovered that the women teachers did not expect any. Some of the women who were for reform cut their hair and wore bloomer dresses, which were shorter and easier to move in. Mrs. Stanton wore one, and finally, Susan did too. One day, when Susan came out of a post office in New York City wearing a bloomer dress, some men and boys laughed at her. They shouted and made faces. Soon, she gave up wearing it. She believed that people would listen to what she had to say, not watch what she was wearing. So you can see her there in the bloomer dress, and then there were the people making fun of her. It's never okay to make fun of people. At a convention of men who were for temperance, Susan was not allowed to speak, but told to listen and learn because she was a woman. She was so angry that she started a women's organization in which she and other women were able to speak freely. That was the first of many organizations she started. During another convention, Susan organized volunteers to gather signatures on a petition to change some laws. The new laws would allow married women to own property and to vote. Although the volunteers gathered 10,000 signatures and presented the position to lawmakers, the laws were not changed. This only made Susan more determined. She wanted the true woman, the new true woman, as she called her, to be the center of her own life. Susan had been one voice among many that had spoken against slavery. After the Civil War, when slavery was officially abolished in the United States, Susan and Mrs. Stanton started a magazine called The Revolution which pushed for the right of women and freed slaves to vote. Then the 15th Amendment was passed, giving African-American men the right to vote. Women still could not cast a ballot. Susan had worked hard on many reform causes for 22 years, but this action made her focus. Now she would fight only for the cause, women's suffrage. Susan received a notice from the Internal Revenue Service saying that since the revolution had earned money, taxes were owed. She wrote a letter to the government saying this was unfair. If she did not have the right to vote, why was she expected to pay taxes? Susan continued to go to more conventions and gave more speeches. It seemed as if the law would never change. But Susan continued the battle. She said, I am in an unpopular cause and must be content to row upstream. By her 50th birthday, she was known as the most loved and hated woman in America. Many women who had worked with her got discouraged and quit to get married. But marriage had never interested her. A few years later, she wrote, I never felt I could give up my life of freedom to become a man's housekeeper. When I was young, if a girl married 
poor, she became a housekeeper and a drudge. If she married wealth, she became a pet and a doll. Just think, had I married at 20, I would have been a drudge or a doll for 50 years. Think of it. Susan argued that the 14th Amendment stated that all persons born or naturalized in the United States could vote. It didn't say women couldn't vote. So she convinced 50 other women to register and vote. Susan was arrested for voting and had to stand trial. She was found guilty and ordered to pay a fine, but she never did. The trial, however, worked for her and made her and the cause even more famous. So you can see her there in court. Susan's battle was a long one. While she was fighting it, she did not believe that women would have the right to vote in her lifetime. Susan and Mrs. Stanton worked for years on a series of books called The History of Woman Suffrage to tell their story to future women who would continue the fight. When she was in her 60s, Susan traveled to Europe to lecture. At home, she began turning over the cause to younger women. Still, all decisions passed by their leader, Susan, who was by now known as the general. Susan died on March 13th, 1906. After 58 years of fighting for reform, she never had the right to vote, but her story was not finished. Those who had continued Susan's battle fought on, and in 1920, 14 years after Susan's death, Congress voted to pass the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. It gives women citizens over the age of 21 the right to vote. It is also called the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. In her last public speech, Susan had said, failure is impossible. And for Susan, it was. So here is today's story. It's so nice to know that we have had champions come before us that who gave us the rights we have today. During the last presidential election, the first woman won the nomination of a major uh, political party, excuse me. She was the first woman to receive the nomination for a major, major political party to run for president. And people um, went to Susan B. Anthony's grave on election day to pay her respect for giving that woman Secretary Hillary Clinton the right to run for the presidency. Now, a hundred years later, the Democratic, the potential Democratic nominee, Joe Biden, has promised a woman running mate. So a hundred years later, we're still paying tribute to Susan B. Anthony. Thank you, friends. Have a great day. Bye-bye.